Roger Moore's first James Bond film saw him jump headfirst into a crazy world of voodoo, black magic and gangsters. It's live and let die. <laughs> <laughs> Sean Connery was offered 5 million to return to the role of James Bond, which would be the equivalent of about 30 mil today, mental money, but he was done with the role, but he did indeed endorse Roger Moore for the next James Bond. There were many other names considered going into this, such as, believe it or not, Clint Eastwood. But Eastwood declined due to the fact that he thought Bond should be played by a British guy and also that was the reason Burt Reynolds gave. Yep, they also considered Burt Reynolds. But ultimately Roger Moore was cast after he had already been considered for James Bond way back in the Doctor No days. Obviously he was known for playing the Saint on TV and that kind of, throughout the entire time people were seeing him as kind of a James Bond character anyway. Roger Moore has an immediate presence as James Bond, but he feels different to Sean Connery. He brings the kind of charming, gentleman, but like cheeky, roguish style to James Bond. And it's fascinating to watch him in Living That Die because he's still honing the role of James Bond. He comes in with immediate star power, immediate presence. He does really well, but it's kind of like when Tom Baker played Doctor Who. When he first came in, you could see he was going to be great, and he was great. But he went on to do a lot more with the character and develop the character. That's kind of what I think happened with Roger Moore. He came in great, but then he stayed for so many years and so many movies as James Bond and truly made the character his own. My name's Bond. James Bond. Roger Moore really has this dry wit and humour immediately in Live and Let Die. James Bond was supposed to be less, I guess, short-tempered and dangerous, I guess. He kind of... His brain and his mouth got him through under Roger Moore, whereas under Sean Connery, he would be vi very violent when he needed to be and very aggressive. And he did have a short temper and he didn't really care that much. But Roger Moore's bond was kind of more reserved and kind of gentlemanly. There is an immediate fresh feeling to live and let die. Obviously, we'd seen Sean Connery so long as James Bond. We'd seen George Lazenby for one movie as James Bond. And now it was entirely time for a new era. Obviously that song, Live and Let Die, is one of the greatest Bond themes. If this ever-changing world in which we're living makes you give in and cry Say live and let die The theme kind of pops up throughout the film and really adds a lot of uh, atmosphere and style to the film. It's one of the perfect Bond themes because it can be used in the action scenes very well and you don't really think that when you first hear it. It doesn't sound like a song that is going to be great for action but it really really is when it comes in. For me Live and Let Die really stands out because it has that black exploitation, that black magic, that voodoo theme. It's bonkers. Obviously the black exploitation era was in full swing at this time and it is crazy to think that James Bond basically did a black exploitation film. This is a black exploitation film with James Bond put into it. Even though Roger Moore's great, what's around him is just so memorable and so crazy and so wild and over the top and unforgettable. You know, it, it elevates things even further. Like I feel like Roger Moore didn't have to have the whole film resting on his shoulders because he had such a nutty backdrop that he could kind of just work on being a good James Bond he didn't have to carry the entire quality of the film on his shoulders because he had a great plot he had a great setting he had great characters and actors around him you know just the costumes the vibes the crazy imagery the voodoo it's all here and it's just always stuck in my head ever since I was a child I always remember these crazy images from Live and Let Die there is a sense of underlying weirdness and creepiness to Live and Let Die that I don't think exists in any other James Bond film, to be honest. Obviously, the villains are a big part of that. You've got Baron Samady, who is an unforgettable James Bond character. That iconic smile and that iconic laugh is so disturbing. Just the look of the character is so unnerving. It's probably one of the most unpredictable James Bond villains of all time. Actor Jeffrey Holder does incredibly well to keep you on the edge of your seat whenever he's on screen. And we have our main villain, Kananga, played by Yafit Koto, who is just this desperate, crazy drug lord who just wants to cling on um, to his tarot card reading Servant Solitaire, played by Jane Seymour. He's just obsessed with his life being read by these cards 
and just he believes in the cards 100 percent and his life is kind of determined by the cards so he's always on edge and it's just a real um seriousness this performance by Yafit Koto he's desperate to kill James Bond he's desperate to keep things under wraps and he's desperate to carry on being this drug lord who controls everything so many memorable moments with Kananga like that moment where James Bond says he wants to speak to Kananga so the guy rips his face off and it is Kananga so he kind of has these disguises also he goes along with a weird kind of voodoo uh, feeling of the film I just like how he loses his patience so many times with James Bond in this but then in certain other moments he's able to be calm and collected. I feel like Yafit Koto's Kananga, you can see there's a real boiling anger inside of him and he could explode at any point. And, and you know, Yafit Koto was a great actor, so it really is a great performance. Jane Seymour is of course solitaire, Kananga's servant who reads the cards for him. And Jane Seymour was a star. Immediately on screen she has so much star presence. And she's one of the most sweet James Bond girls because Bond really, 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 really takes advantage of her. You prick Bond. Like he literally uses her belief in the cards against her to take her virginity. What an arsehole. I guess he's took her away from a very evil man, you know, in a life that um, she shouldn't be in, I guess. But it's just bad that he did it in that way. But I guess he, I guess in the scenario he had to get information and stuff. But she's just so sweet and innocent and you feel bad that she's being manipulated by everyone around her. She very much is of the era where Bond girls were very, very memorable and very, very well acted and very, very well presented, but didn't really have much in the way of a strong character. Very much they were manipulated as part of the story, which is a shame. Constant memorable scenes in this. There's a bus chase. There's a fantastic boat chase. There's a wonderful moment, which is a classic James Bond set piece where Bond gets put in this death trap with these crocodiles and he runs across a line of crocodiles to escape. Always been ingrained in my mind. What a great moment, a great moment where Bond shows his resourcefulness, his bravery, and he, why he can do what no one else can do because no one else would have escaped it in that way. That crocodile stunt was attempted many times by the stuntman who was actually called Kananga, believe it or not. The villain was named after him. And he failed so many times and fell into the water and ended up with his clothes ripped to shreds by the crocodiles several times. It took hours to complete. Obviously in the film universe, Bond just does it straight away because, you know, it's bloody Bond. I guess Live and Let Die doesn't have the most memorable culmination of the film. After what we've seen with all this craziness in the movie, You'd expect a more wild and over the top combination between James Bond and Kananga. You don't, it's more basic, but it's still fun. Has Bond been put into a death trap, which he escapes and he wrestles Kananga. It's not the best Bond combination, but it's still one that stands out in my mind because I love the, the presence of Roger Moore, the presence of Yafit Koto, and the direction of Guy Hamilton, which really needs to be talked about. Guy Hamilton, a prolific James Bond director, really creates some suspense and excitement in this combination, even though it's not as wild and crazy as the rest of the movie. Such a great energy to live and let die, and till to this day, there's no James Bond movie like it. There, there may be even no movie like it, you know, in the way that you pluck a British secret agent and put him into this black exploitation, crazy world, the way that it's Roger Moore's debut, the way it has this fresh, original, new energy to it. Live and let die, to me, still really, really resonates and really gets you excited about the future of James Bond with Roger Moore. What do you guys think of Live and Let Die? Let me know in the comments below. I want to bring back some James Bond reviews to this channel, so I'm definitely going to be talking about James Bond a lot more in the future. Maybe I'll go on and review more of the Roger Moore movies. Be sure to subscribe to this channel if you're a movie geek just like me. Click on another video on the screen now, which will probably be a James Bond one, which I've done in the past. And thanks for watching once again. I will see you guys next time.